to the April meeting of atheists and other free thinkers and Sacramento free thinkers, atheists and non-believers. Our main speaker will be Steve Hill, who is a comedian and former prison guard. That'll be interesting. Um, our meeting this time around is being run on the technical end by our host, Gleb Sapersky, PhD. Gleb is a cognitive neuroscientist and behavioral economist passionate about promoting truth, rational thinking, and wise decision making. He runs the nonprofit Intentional Insights at intentionalinsights.org and co founded the Pro Truth Pledge. You can find that at protruthpledge.org. He serves as the CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts at disasteravoidanceexperts.com. He is the best-selling author of a number of books, most notably Pro-Truth, A Pragmatic Plan to Put Truth Back into Politics, and other national bestsellers, such as The Truth Seeker's Handbook, A Science-Based Guide, and Resilience, Adapt and Plan for the New Abnormal of the Pandemic. He's published over 550 articles, and has given over 450 interviews for prominent venues such as Time, USA, Scientific American, Psychology Today, and so on and so on. Uh, others include the Skeptical Inquirer, the Humanist, the Skeptic, and Free Inquiry. He was for seven years a professor at the Ohio State University. And you can email him at gleb, that's G-L-E-B as in boy, at intentionalinsights.org. So this is another fine presentation of AOF and its speaker series and supported by your membership and donations and plenty of volunteer labor. So to become an official member of AOF and a card-carrying atheist, go to www.aofonline.org slash join and scroll down for details. So Dr. Gleb Sapersky, please take it away. Thank you for that kind introduction. And I appreciate if everyone had a chance to turn off their mics. And I do appreciate if everyone had a chance to go and donate and become a member, official member of Sacramento Freethinkers, Ethies and so on. That is a very important way that you can support your local community your local secular community. And I can tell you that I've been, for the seven years that I've been here in Columbus, no, it's been already 10 years that I've been here in Columbus, Ohio, I've been a member of the Humanist Community of Central Ohio, which is our big local secular group. So definitely a member, definitely support, supporting your local secular group. And they bring you these events. And of course, they create a secular community for everyone there. So. Without further ado, let's talk about today's topic. Now, why do smart people make some bad decisions? Why do they get fooled? Why do they fall into various cognitive biases? That's what we'll be talking about. So why do they fall for fake news? Now, presumably most of you think of yourself as smart as not all of you. And generally the research shows that people who are secular tend to be smarter than the average. But there are some ways that still smart people get fooled. So that's something for us to be really aware of. And you've probably heard about a number of cognitive biases and that's where people fall into problems. So cognitive biases are the dangerous judgment errors we make because of how our brains are wired. And I'll start by talking about just not, so not in politics. I mean, this is about fake news, right? But about a different topic about driving. So before so I'm going to talk about driving just a little bit to talk about our decision-making and driving. Now, when you think about yourself driving and when you're driving out there in the road in the Sacramento area, wherever you're driving, how good do you feel about yourself as a driver? How confident are you about yourself as a driver? Are you making good decisions or bad decisions? So do you think you're in the top half of all drivers or in the bottom half of all drivers? I'm going to launch a poll and you'll be able to vote. Tell me whether you think and everyone else, whether you're in the top half of all drivers or in the bottom half. So again, top half or bottom half of all drivers. Please go ahead and vote. It 
see about half of you voted. Let's get the rest voting. Eighty percent of you voted. I'll give you five more seconds to make your voice heard if you haven't yet decided whether you're in the top half or bottom half. All right. So check out the results. Fascinating, isn't it? That 95% of you are in the top half of all drivers. <laughs> this is, uh, you might have heard of this as the late well begone effect, where everyone is above average. <laughs> so, this is one of the ways that smart people fall for fake news. They fall for what's known as the overconfidence bias. The overconfidence bias. It's one of our many dangerous cognitive biases. I'll talk about what they are later. These are basically mental mistakes we make when we evaluate how the world works. And we feel very confident about ourselves. We're smart people, we make good decisions. And then when we look at information, we feel that we're able to deal with it easily. That, hey, I can easily deal with this information and I can process it and it will definitely be, I feel, right about this information or I feel that this information is wrong and because I'm smart I can evaluate it quickly and make a confident decision and when you're confident that means that you're not very open to changing your mind and you're not very open to doing a thorough evaluation what to determine whether this information is accurate or not accurate so that's one of the biggest reasons why smart people like yourselves fall for fake news, the overconfidence bias. Now, this result uh, with a poll, that's very typical of these polls. And you saw 95%, again, 5%. It sh shows up in all sorts of situations. So for example, there was a study on a series of professors in, professors uh, study in uh, actually California. I think it was one of the universities of California. I don't remember whether it's Stanford or so on. But the university said, uh, the study asked whether a similar poll, a similar survey with more methodological rigor that asked professors whether they think that compared to all the other professors in the, on that campus, whether they were in the top half of all professors or in the bottom half, are they above average or below average? And you had something like 93% of all professors saying that they're above average. And uh, the same results apply to all sorts of situations. So for example, uh, another example of the way to overcome, so one way that this result applies is that you feel yourself to be smarter than you are. You feel yourself to be better than you are. So you feel more confident. That also applies, interestingly, the more experienced you are. So think about smartness, right? Smartness has to do with studying a topic, learning more about it, understanding it. Well, one aspect of smartness is your innate capabilities, your innate capabilities of intelligence, what you get in you know, various exams, how good are you at solving various intellectual problems, how good are you at parsing, reading complex topics, and so on. Another one is your experience with a topic, so how experienced are you? So that is another area of smartness where people tend to be overconfident. There was an interesting study of doctors senior doctors and junior doctors. Senior doctors mean doctors who had over a decade of experience in the field and junior doctors meaning ones who just left medical school. They were both presented with the same case study, the same case, and asked to make a diagnosis and give a recommendation for how to treat the patient. And they both got the answers right at about the same percentage. So both the senior doctors with their years of experience and know-how and the junior doctors who just left medical school got the answer at about the same percentage right. But the senior doctors, the study also measured confidence. And what the study found is that the senior doctors were way more confident than the junior doctors, way more confident than the junior doctors. So obviously that's a problem, but they got the same percentage right, but they were way more confident. So that's another way that the overconfidence bias works. <laughs> it's 
Someone asks Eugene Ma, is the poll question biased? Instead of two classes, what about scale from like one to 10? Well, that's not how the study, that's not how the researchers ask the question. So I'm asking you the question in the way that the researchers ask the question naturally. Otherwise it really wouldn't be a good comparison. It wouldn't, wouldn't be very fair to you. So that's the overconfidence bias. And that's something that you need to be thinking about as smart people who want to address your vulnerability, which we are all vulnerable to for falling for fake news and other sorts of misinformation. So that's one. Now let's go on to cognitive biases. What are these? Cognitive biases are the specific dangerous judgment errors our mind makes because of the way it's wired. When we see a piece of information with which we like, we feel confident about it. And that's one of the ways that our mind goes wrong. But it goes wrong in so many other ways because we trust our gut, we trust our intuitions, we trust our feelings, we trust how we feel about information and about our decisions, about our behaviors. You often hear people tell you to go with your gut, trust your heart, follow your intuition. You know, people like Tony Robbins tell you to you know, be primal, be savage, you know, go with your intuitions, go with what you feel. Or Malcolm Gladwell in a more intellectual spirit tells you to make your decision in the blink of an eye in his book, Blink. So all of those sorts of folks and many, many people, including many people, unfortunately, in the secular community, tell you to trust your gut and follow your intuition. That feels very comfortable. I mean, going with our gut feels very comfortable, feels very good to us because we like our gut. We like doing what we're comfortable with. We like doing what we feel like. But unfortunately, that often leads to very, very bad decisions and us misperceiving on information very badly because our gut our intuitions, our emotions are actually not wired for the modern world. They're wired for the ancient savanna. That's what they're wired for. Our emotions, our intuitions, our gut reactions, that's what they're for. That's what they're about. So imagine us living, our ancestors living in that savanna environment, ancestral savanna environment, in small tribes of 15 people to 150 people. And you had to be very tribal in that environment. You had to look for, you had to look for people who are like you. You had to support them. You had to like them. People who share your characteristics, who share what you like and what you dislike, who are part of your tribe. Because if you weren't sufficiently tribal, they take you out of the tribe and you die. And if you weren't sufficiently hostile to other people who come from other tribes to try to conquer yours, then your tribe would be conquered and you die as well. And you notice we're the descendants of those people who didn't die. <laughs> so given that we're the descendants of those people who didn't die, it's something for us to understand that we are very much wired to be tribal. And that really relates to the kind of information that we absorb. We don't like information that goes against the, the information that's associated with our tribe, whether it's people on the left or people on the right, whichever perception you feel yourself, Democrat, Republican, whatever, other sorts of ideologies, libertarian, socialist, those sorts of you know, ideologies very much determine where we fall on the kind of information we like and we don't like, what kind of news sources we consume, what sources of authority we trust. And then when other tribes have information that's accurate, we don't appreciate it and accept it and we reject it. So that's a big problem, tribalism and information, because sometimes other people have the right ideas and sometimes our tribe doesn't have the right ideas, but that's something that it would be very hard for us to appreciate and understand if we don't accept that this tribal mentality pushes us to make bad decisions around information, pushes us to fall for fake news. And then we fall for fake news. We don't realize that we're doing it. So that's a big problem, tribalism. Next, on the related aspect of these dangerous judgment errors, cognitive biases, has to do with the fight or flight response. So one of the aspects that's really powerful from that Savannah background is tribalism. Another dynamic that's really powerful is the fight or flight response, the fight or flight response. Now, that you might've heard of it as a saber tooth tiger response. When you jump at a hundred shadows, it's better to jump at a hundred shadows than to miss that one saber tooth tiger for our ancestors. In the modern world, that's still inbuilt in us, the fight or flight response, the way that we respond to information, the way that we respond to ideas, the way that we respond to other people, the way that we respond to behaviors and so on. Now, 
in the modern world, we have many, many, many fewer saber-toothed tigers. <laughs> you know, but the way that we respond to an article that we see on social media is very much of a fight or flight response or the headline that we see or some kind of email that comes to us with the headline, some information. It's very much a fight or flight response where we are very much tempted to make instant snap quick judgments. And that gets us into a lot of trouble. So the fight or flight response gets us into a lot of trouble. And there are other aspects of that Savannah environment that cause us to make bad decisions, as well as just generally the structure of our brain. And I can talk about that for a while, but I'll leave that for the Q&A for those who want more of the structure of the brain. So all of these specific, all of these ways that our mind goes wrong in the modern world are described as cognitive biases. Cognitive biases, the overconfidence bias is one type of cognitive bias. Cognitive biases are the specific mental patterns that cause us, that describe the kind of mistakes we make in the modern world. And the overconfidence bias is only one of them. There's over a hundred of these cognitive biases. So you can check out my work on this topic, which Susan mentioned. So there's a book I wrote called Pro Truth, A Pragmatic Plan to Put Truth Back into Politics, and as well as the Truth Seekers Handbook, a science-based guide. All of those talk about these cognitive biases, how they cause us to fall for fake news bad information, smart people like ourselves, secular people and free thinkers and so on. And how can we address these problems? You can just look at the list of cognitive biases in Wikipedia. There's a list of over a hundred of them. And it's something for you to understand and know about because a lot of them will cause you to fall for bad information. Now I'm curious whether any of you had the following experience with cognitive biases. So it will be a poll. Did you ever have the following happen to you? You made a bad decision. And looking back, you realize you had the information you needed to make a better decision. Or some significant decision in your life where you made a bad decision. And looking back, you realize you really had the information you needed to make a better decision in that moment. So please go ahead and vote. about half of you voted. Let's give you five more seconds for the rest of you. All right. So this happened to the overwhelming majority of you that nearly nine out of 10 people, this is something that happened to you. And so you have the visceral experience of the cognitive biases. And this is something that you need to realize is just very common where you make a bad decision and you have the information you need to make a better decision. Now let's talk about some more aspects of tribalism. There's a specific pair of cognitive biases that I want to familiarize you with that you should be familiar with called the halo effect and the horns effect. The halo effect and the horns effect. The halo effect refers to somebody having a little halo on their head. It's when you like a characteristic of someone. The one, this is a characteristic that makes it feel like this person is part of your tribe, whether it's their appearance, whether it's their cultural background, whether it's their ideology, whether it's their religion, their politics, whatever, sexuality, then you will tend to like all the other aspects of that person more than you deserve, than they deserve. You will tend to trust them and like them. The horns effect is the opposite. It refers to somebody having little horns. And you can, of course, tell how this is coming from the religious background, but that's the technical scientific names of these, so the halo effect and the horns effect. If you dislike one aspect of someone, their accent, their background, their anything about their politics, anything about their ideology, their appearance, then you will tend to dislike other things around this person. This is, of course, very problematic for the way that we absorb information and for the way that we make decisions around other people. So I'll share with you a little video from a presentation that I gave. You should be able to see my screen now and you should also be able to hear the sound once I start the video. So as you know, I'm a professor at Ohio State. I'm contractually obligated to root for the Buckeyes. <laughs> Let me give you a context. So I'm the pro so at that time, as Susan mentioned, I was a professor at Ohio State. And for those of you who don't know, the Ohio State has this football team called the Buckeyes. It's a really, really big deal here in Columbus, Ohio, where I live. So go Bucks, it's really big. 
And our big, big rival is the University of Michigan Wolverines. It's one of the biggest rivalries in college football, if not the biggest. So I'm gonna, so I'm talking here at a presentation for a group of HR professionals. This is a closing keynote at, for a diversity inclusion conference for over a hundred HR leaders who are specializing in diversity inclusion. So over a hundred HR leaders who are making decisions about who to hire and who to fire. And I'm asking them, talking to them about the halo effect and the horns effect. I'm asking them whether the, this is in central Ohio. I'm asking them whether they would hire a University of Michigan fan. So remember the rivalry between you know, the Ohio State University, the Buckeyes and the University of Michigan Wolverines. I'm asking them whether they would hire a Wolverines fan. As you know, I'm a professor at Ohio State. I'm contractually obligated to root for the Buckeyes. <laughs> I'm guessing there are a lot of Buckeyes fans here, you know. Go Bucks, right? Hey, oh, there you go. Now, how likely are you to hire a Michigan fan? See, three people. Now, over a hundred of them. Regardless of how we feel about Michigan fans and their poor, poor choices, <laughs> in which team to root for, does that indicate anything about their performance as an employee? No, I know. Come on, that no should be stronger. <laughs> so, what happened there? Three people out of over a hundred were willing to hire. University of Michigan fan. I gave them the opportunity to change their mind and they really didn't want to change their mind. This shows you the power of this tribalism, this halo and horns effect. So it makes a big, big impact in this fundamentally important area of hiring people and firing people. And this is for something as simple and innocuous as which team you're rooting for in football. Now think about how much more powerful that becomes when it's about political teams, Republican, Democrat, whatever your flavor, how important that is for which people you choose to associate with, which information you choose to accept, which information you choose to not accept, how that impacts you, how that is a really powerful driver of various pretty problematic dynamics in many respects. So, curious to do another poll about the halo effect and the horns effect. Do you think it would be valuable for you to address any negative impacts from the halo effect or the horns effect in your life, in your decision making? Let's say about two thirds of you voted. Good, I'll give you five more seconds for the rest of you who went to vote. All right, so this is pretty universal. Clearly, all of you would like to address this issue to some extent or other, the halo effect and the horns effect. Great to hear. This is definitely important and something for you to be thinking about. Now, another question that I want to, you to be thinking about is what we're paying attention to. So what are you paying attention to? And in what moments are you paying attention to the right things? In what moments are you paying attention to the wrong things. It's very easy for us to be distracted and pay attention to something that is problematic and not and ignore things that we really should be paying attention to because we are very tempted. Our predispositions, our existing beliefs cause us to focus our attention on things that we want to hear. They've probably heard about a cognitive bias called the confirmation bias. If you heard about one cognitive bias, this is the most famous one of them all. So the confirmation bias, very, very famous. It causes us to look for information that confirms our beliefs and ignore information that doesn't confirm our beliefs. So it's, it's about where we're paying our attention and what we like and dislike. So that goes back to the fight or flight response. We very quickly make very quick snap judgments about information that's placed in front of us. And either we like the information or we dislike the information. So that's kind of the how we reject information that doesn't correspond to our predispositions. When somebody says something, gives us a piece of data, a fact that goes against our beliefs, it's very unlikely for us to kind of give it its due consideration just because of how our brain is wired. <laughs> that's just how we believe and that's a problem. 
we also look for information that confirms our beliefs. Now, let's say that you know you think that Donald Trump is stupid. Let's say you think that, of, and you look for information on Google saying why is Donald Trump stupid. What kind of answer are you going to get? That answer, of course, will give you information showing you that Donald Trump, you know, maybe didn't get high scores or something else, I don't know, on his tests or other things that, that indicate stupidity, right? That's the kind of information that Google would give you. And that applies to every other sort of question that you will search. The framing of the question, the framing of the idea in your mind that causes you to frame the question that way will result in the consequence that you want to hear. Now, interestingly, the confirmation bias is often seen as particularly impactful for especially smart people. So especially smart people tend to fall for the confirmation bias more strongly than other folks. So for example, when you are looking at people's beliefs around the environment and global warming, so when you look at that and you look at how what people believe who are educated versus people who are not educated. The more educated people are, and you will see that people who are more educated, people who are liberal, who are more educated, will tend to have a stronger belief that human-caused global warming is real and a problem for us. So that's kind of one dynamic. And that's something that you can probably expect because that's aligns with the scientific perspective. Okay, that you know, liberals tend to believe that scientific perspective. Now, the interesting thing is when you're looking at the conservatives who tend to have less of a strong belief in human-caused global warming than that human-caused global warming is a problem. When you look at that population, the conservative population, you'll tend to see that the more educated, smart, intelligent conservatives are, the more powerfully they will reject this argument, the less they will believe that human-caused global warming exists, the less they will believe that it's a problem. Why is that? Researchers tried to figure this out for a while, and our best theory on this is that, which makes a lot of sense, is that people who are smart find more ways to fall for the confirmation bias by convincing themselves, rationalizing any information they get into their beliefs. So when they find information, people who are smarter tend to find loopholes, find ways of arguing out of any problems. You know, people like to, who are smarter tend to like to argue and they find themselves ways to convince themselves that this information that they're seeing is incorrect. They find loopholes, they, are, they tend to cherry pick data and so on. And so that is a big prob problem, especially for smart people who are especially prone to falling for the confirmation bias. So if you consider yourself smart, that's something that you need to be really watching out for, the confirmation bias. So let's see about the confirmation bias poll. Do you think it would be valuable for you to address any negative impacts from the confirmation bias in your life? Half of you voted. I'll give you five more seconds, the rest of you, to make your voice heard. All right. So almost all of you would like to address the confirmation bias. So one of you thinks that that's not a problem for them, that they don't want to address it. But the vast majority of you do definitely want to address the confirmation bias. So I'm glad to, to see that. And the one of you who doesn't, I'm sorry to hear that because yeah, you're likely falling for what's called the bias blind spot where we tend to ignore our own biases. Sorry, I call, I tell it like it is. All right, now the confirmation bias is one aspect of our attention and our liking. Now let's focus a little bit more on attention. What we pay attention to is really important and what draw, who and what draws our attention to the right or wrong topics is really important. So I'll share with you another video that I really like and I think is really illustrated called the monkey business solution. Great. The monkey business solution. 
Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. The correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. And that's the monkey business illusion. Learn more about this illusion. All right, so that hopefully is mostly self-explanatory. When we're looking for certain information, when we're looking at counting the balls or looking at passes or, or looking for a gorilla, we tend to miss other important aspects of our environment. I'm curious, if just in the chat, tell me how many of you saw all three, the gorilla, the the gorilla, the curtain changing color, and the player leaving. So in the chat, just chat how many of you saw all three. I'll give you five seconds to share if you saw that. So Jeff didn't. Angela now saw none of those. So at this point, I presume that nobody saw all three and Roger saw only one, right? So this is pretty common where we tend to really focus on the what we're focusing on, on the details, on the information, and we don't notice the background context. And the background context didn't really matter all that much in the Savannah environment. So think about the fight or flight response. We had to respond to to a saber-toothed tiger. That's what we had to respond to. That's what we were focusing on. And that's great if we want to survive, you know, this, the fight or flight response, if that's what we need to decide. But think about what happens when you're reading through an article, when you're looking at a piece of information. You're perhaps and very likely only looking for certain very select information that matters to you. And you're failing to notice a lot of other background context information that's shaping your perception in a way that you don't realize is happening. That this information is becoming part of your reading of the article, you're agreeing with the article, maybe you're sharing the article, and then you're spreading misinformation, fake news, because you have not been looking for other aspects of the context. The context is much more important in the modern world than it was in the Savannah environment, but we're not wired to notice the concept, the context very well at all. So that's one of the ways that fake news and misinformation folks will tend to get you. So those are just some of the cognitive biases. And I'm curious with this one, whether you think it would be valuable for you to address any negative impacts from the attentional bias. And that's what it's about, the attentional bias, our tendency to see what is most salient in our environment what is most important for us. Give you five more seconds if you haven't voted yet. All right, so we see the overwhelming majority of you would like to address the attentional bias. That's great to hear. 
and two of you, um, nine percent of you, two of you think that that's not a problem for you. So great well, to hear it's not a problem for you, but the overwhelming majority of you, over nine tenths, would want to address the negative impacts from the attentional bias. And I have to say, given that that there didn't seem to be any of you who saw all three, I'd encourage the two of you who are not interested in addressing the attentional bias too, maybe consider whether that video shows you that maybe you really should be addressing the attentional bias. <laughs> all right, so what ways are there to address this problem for the dark tendency to fall for fake news? So Susan mentioned, I am a supporter of the Pro Truth Pledge, I co-founded it. That's a research-based technique to address our tendency to fall for behaviors that cause us to believe in fake news, trust misinformation, share it, and so on. I'll show you what the Pro Truth Pledge is about. It's a commitment mechanism where you basically make a commitment to be honest. <laughs> and that has a number of dynamics. So let's see. Um, there we go. So this is the Pro Truth Pledge. It's at protruthpledge.org, like you can see. And this is something that has been taken by 285 organizations, 1,025 government officials, 1141 public figures, and of course the rest over 10,000 are ordinary, well, just, or just around 10,000 are ordinary people like yourselves. So ordinary people like yourselves taking the approach approach. And it's been taken by tons of secular leaders. So I've been mentioned, I've been published in the Skeptical Inquirer, the Humanist, the Essays of Humanism, of various, the skeptics of so Michael Shermer took it, Dan Barker took it, Aaron Rod took it, No Legends took it. I can cite tons of names. Philosophic Atheist Alliance of America took it as an organization. A number of other organizations took it, local uh, organizations around the country. So uh, Sacramento Fan as an organization can take the approach of pledge and commit as an organization to it. And you can all commit to it as individuals if you would like. So this is a commitment mechanism where you commit yourself to behaviors that address our tendency to fall for misinformation. So what are these behaviors that you're committing to when you take the approach of pledge? So you pledge your earnest efforts. That means you know, you're not, you don't assume that you'll always be perfect, but you're gonna be trying honestly to do 12 behaviors. One has to do, the first category has to do with you sharing the truth yourself. Fact check information to confirm it's true before accepting it, before believing it and sharing it. So fact check information, right? Seems obvious. Then share the whole truth, even if some aspects don't support my opinion. That's our tendency to cherry pick information when we share it and to not tell the whole truth when some of the aspects of the facts don't support what we believe. Share my sources so that others can verify my information. It's very important to do that. And it's if you can't share your sources, that might mean that you're confabulating information, meaning that you're believing certain things that didn't actually come from a verified source. Maybe you saw something in some article somewhere, maybe someone told you and you took it within yourself and now you can't find a good source for it. That maybe means that you don't have a good source for it. Distinguish between my opinion and the facts. You know, it can, the fact is that it's 80 degrees outside. Your opinion is whether that's hot or whether that's cold. <laughs> The same thing about, you know, let's say the number of gun deaths is, you know, I don't know, a thousand gun deaths, then you can, whether, you know, that's too many or not too many is something that is your opinion. And that's something that is a perception. So you need to differentiate between the facts and opinions. Next, honoring truth. So acknowledge when other people share true information, even when you disagree otherwise. That's really important, addresses tribalism. So the tribalism, the halo effect, the horns effect, that is very important. So honoring truth, that's about you interacting with others. Reevaluate if your information is challenged and retract it if you can't verify it. That is another really important dynamic where you want to make sure that if you your information is challenged and if you can't verify it, you know, that has to do with sharing my sources. Sometimes we're not perfect, we don't share all the sources. 
But if your information is challenged, you want to retract it if you can't verify it. Then defend others when they come under attack for sharing true information, even when you disagree otherwise. So that is another aspect of tribalism. To address tribalism, you need to be effective at helping others who are honest and truthful, and even when they're not on your side. And then align my opinions and my actions with true information. So make sure that your opinions and your actions are aligned with the facts, because sometimes we can say, well, the facts are this, but I'm not going to act on it, and that's a problem. Finally, encourage truth. This is a category of behaviors that has to do with our community. How do you encourage truth in your community? Again, another aspect of tribalism. Ask people to retract information that reliable sources have disproved, even if those people are my allies. So again, addressing tribalism. Compassionately inform those around me to stop using unreliable sources, even if these sources support my opinion. So here you want to be careful. There are a number of sources, let's say, on the left, like the equivalent, the Drudge Report on the right and the equivalent on the left. You know, some media organizations on both sides have very questionable sources. And you want to make sure that this is a credible source. And even if the source shares your opinions and your values, you never want to use a not very credible source, one that shares misinformation as something that you would use to verify your opinions. Then recognize the opinions of experts as more likely to be accurate when the facts are disputed. And this is a simple one. People who are scientists, let's say, they're more likely to be right on a topic than someone who's a not scientist on a certain field. Someone who's an expert in the field is more likely to be right. That doesn't mean that they're absolutely right. That doesn't mean that you're wrong. It's just more likely to be right. So recognize the opinions as if experts is more likely to be right. So default, you know, most cases, they'll be more right than someone who's a non-expert. If you have a specific reason why an expert might be wrong, for example, you know, if, some, if there's a scientist who's paid by the tobacco industry to research tobacco, you might be a little bit you know, suspicious of their findings when they say tobacco is completely fine, no, no cancer causing elements at all, right? So those are reasons to not trust the opinions of experts in certain situations. But everything else being equal, the experts are more likely to be right. And finally, celebrate those who retract incorrect statements and update their beliefs toward the truth. This has to do with helping create positive incentives for people who are truthful. Right now, people who are truthful have pretty negative incentives when they're accused of being flip-floppers, criticized, and so on. This is a big problem in all sorts of areas, in politics and public life and so on. This helps address the problem. Now, the pro-truth pledge, oof, there are a couple of things that people often want to know. So what's considered misinformation? Misinformation is anything that goes against reality. Direct lying, lying by omission, misrepresenting the truth to suit one's purpose. So for you, credible fact-checking sites and the scientific consensus is something that the pro-truth pledge uses. And I can give, go much more in depth in, in the Q&A. So how are pledge takers held accountable? That's a common question that folks ask. So pledge takers are held accountable through crowdsourcing the truth. For the general public, that's people like you who are not public figures. You would rely on personal commitment to the truth combined with community accountability. So fellow free thinkers, secular folks in your community who know you've taken the pledge, they will help hold you accountable. And that happens very frequently. More relevant for public figures, there's reputational rewards. So there's volunteers who evaluate information shared by public figures. And violating the pledge is something that if a public figure doesn't retract their statements and update their beliefs toward the truth, they get reputational punishments, pretty seriously reputational punishments. Then they are widely publicized in all public venues, resulting in sizable public reputational damage to the public figure. So rewards of taking the pledge. So you, obviously you benefit from more public truth driven culture and cultivating so socially beneficial habits of mind, word and deed. So that's kind of the goal, to have a more truthful, more civil society, hold public figures accountable, hold private citizens accountable. So that is the goal. And I can, can go more into that. Impact of the pro-truth pledge. 
that gives you a number of case studies of people who changed their mind, public figures. So for example, a candidate for Congress, Michael Smith took the pledge and he posted a on his Facebook, a screenshot of a tweet by Donald Trump criticizing minority and disabled children. He couldn't find the source for it in Donald Trump's feed. And he then made a different, edited the Facebook post to say, due to a truth pledge I've taken, I have to say that I haven't been able to verify this post. So that's another example. And there are so many others who do some similar things. Now, the science behind the pro-truth pledge. That's something many secular folks want to know who are very oriented to science. There are a number of peer reviewed studies that show the pro-truth pledge is effective. So for example, there's a study that's linked in the website in the academic journal Behavior and Social Issues, which, repo which shows the results of a study evaluating people who took the pledge and then shared information on Facebook. Researchers examined the first 10 news relevant posts one month after study participants took the pledge and graded the quality of the information shared. And then they looked at the first 10 news relevant posts 11 months before they took the pledge and rated those. So it's a calendar year difference. And the study found really large statistically significant improvements in pledge takers adherence to all the behaviors of the pledge, such as fewer posts containing misinformation and including more sources. So that's, and the, again, I can talk about all of these other things later. So that's something I wanted to share with you. And I wanted to see if you had any questions about the pro-truth pledge before I go on to the broader, the broader uh, Q&A about cognitive biases and so on. So you can ask in the chat or if you don't have, uh, if it's not easy for you, you can also unmute yourself. That's also fine. We don't have a large audience. So we, we, should, we should be fine with unmuting. So happy to answer any questions about the approach of pledge before going to the broader Q&A. That improvement is really uh, encouraging, Cleb. Thank you. It's nice to have um, uh, unbiased data to support it too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's excellent for peer review. Anyone do a survey in pro of pledge since January 6th? Of, not that I'm aware of, so not something that I know. And it's, uh, as you may know, it takes a very long time to get a peer reviewed article published, something like in the scale to do a, to do a study. So for, to do these two peer reviewed studies, it took each of them took over two years oh to uh, do a cert, do the study, get the funding for this. Well, of course, start with getting the funding for the study, then do the study, then get it into a peer reviewed journal, get go through all the edits of the peer reviews, and then get it published. Wow, that's rough. Yep, that's just what it is. It's peer reviewed. That, that's why science is quality. <laughs> it's a thorough process. Yes, indeed. Other folks, questions about the pro-truth pledge? Can you unmute can yourself or you can ask in the chat, whichever you prefer. Oh, excellent, Ruth. Yes, thank you for sharing that there's a link to the pro-truth pledge on the AOF website, yep. to the pledge text. If you have any questions about any of the specific behaviors, I know that sometimes questions arise, happy to answer them. All right, in the meantime, while you're thinking about any questions, I'm gonna ask you a question in turn with a polling. Would you like to yourself take the pro truth pledge? So commit to the pro truth pledge. We'll have a volunteer put your information. So you don't necessarily need to go to the website and put your information in, which is how most people do it. But we can have a volunteer put your information in for you. So would you like to tell yourself commit to the pro truth pledge? Please go ahead and vote in the poll. And again, I'm happy to take any questions while folks are voting in the poll.
it's about half of you voted. Let's give the rest of you some time. And I'll give you 10 more seconds if you haven't voted yet. And in the meantime, think about questions. All right, ending polling. Great, so we see that two thirds of you want to take the pro of pledge, that's excellent. And I know that some people have already taken the pro of pledge before the event, so excellent, glad to hear that. Cool. All right, so stop the results and I'll stop the share. Okay, so if no questions about the approach of pledge, I'll be happy to take broader questions around cognitive biases, errors we make. And if you have any, if you have any more questions, of course, about the approach of pledge, you can bring those up as well. I gotta ask you that, how do you deal with really extreme views? Like a flat earth. Hold on for a second. There's somebody who was asking a question already. Ken, can you repeat that? Oh, um, it's my question. Not yes. Uh, okay, go ahead. Our, our question is, how does, how does a person, an intelligent person, end up believing a really outlandish piece of misinformation? For example, we have a friend who's, who's very intelligent, and yet she believes uh, that the moon shot didn't occur and that there are giants living in the Earth. She's a flat Earther. She's a flat Earther. She thinks we're in a dome. Mm -hmm. How, how do people get to that point? Because it's so extreme. Yeah, it's just what I was what I was saying before. When you have your certain priors, so if you look at the kind of the little bit of the neuroscience of how our minds work, there are two aspects of how our minds work, how we take in information. We have certain prior beliefs that we have about the world, about the way the world works, and we have information that we see in front of us, the evidence in front of our eyes. Now, imagine that a UFO landed in front of you, right? How likely are you to believe that this is a UFO versus just some kind of optical illusion? You know, probably many of you would think this is some kind of optical illusion, right? Because the world would have to be very fundamentally different than, it, than you previously think it is for a UFO to be real because there's obviously many, many reasons for why aliens who have the technology to land on Earth would be very unlikely to do it using a UFO, kind of that fits some of these movie themes, right? But if there was an actual UFO in that, you know, teensy weensy possibility, it would be very unlikely for you to believe that this is an actual UFO. So kind of reverse positions with that person. If their worldview is such that world that UFOs are real, the earth is flat, science is bad, it would have to take a very fundamental disruption of their worldview to, they, they would have to really fundamentally change who they are, what they believe, what their tribe is to accept this information that goes against their beliefs. So it would take a very, very strong information, very big adjustment, and they would have to really change their lives. So it's not simply about accepting that flat earth is not real. It's about changing who they are, their identity, their beliefs, their tribes, uh, their tribalism. It's very hard. So that's just something that you have to realize what position they're in. It's so hard for you to understand how they get to those beliefs. That's, uh, that depends on the community. That depends on the tribe. You know, just the way that people fall into cults, right? When people fall into cults, it's about the community that they find. Our beliefs are fundamentally shaped by tribalism. You know, the large, large proportion of our beliefs comes from our tribe. So when people find a tribe that they like, they tend to adopt the tribe's beliefs. You know, same thing for various flavors of religion, right? When, you, when somebody finds a religion that they like because of the community of people, they don't, people don't generally fall for a religion because of the sophisticated intellectual cap capacity of that religion. They fall for it because there's people they like who are in that religion. You know, Jehovah's Witnesses are masters of this. They are excellent, excellent, excellent 
at, this is a, but Jehovah's Witnesses, for those of you who don't know, are one of the most extreme forms of Christianity. Super, super, super extreme. Now, the way that they get so many converts is because they're great at cultivating relationships with people who are lonely and who feel a lack of meaning, a lack of fulfillment. They're great at that. And so people follow not the ideology of the religion, but they follow the people, those kind of lonely people who are cultivated. And so you fall into that, you fall into that tribe, whether it's Jehovah's Witnesses or flat earthers or whatever have you, or the QAnon, right? That gives people a sense of meaning, community, and they like that and they adopt that community. And for them to reject those beliefs would mean rejecting those people, rejecting that community. That's very unlikely. So it's very hard to do. That would explain a lot about Scientology as well. Oh, absolutely. Scientology, all sorts of other sort of ideology-based movements. Tribalism is a very powerful force. Interesting. Let's see. There was a question, I think, in the chat. What are other biases that are you have not mentioned similar specifically mentioned that smart people fall for so they smart people fall for all sorts of biases where being smart allows them to cherry pick information cherry pick information and try to out argue their way against what the reality is so for example there's something called the false consensus effect where people tend to perceive others as having similar beliefs to them. And this is a problem for smart people. I mean, it's a problem for everyone, but it's a problem for smart people where it seems ridiculous that other people wouldn't have the same beliefs as them because you obviously tested your beliefs and you evaluated them and you went through them and you don't realize how different other people are and how different their mindsets are, how different their value systems are. And that they you know, don't have your beliefs, your predispositions, your values. And that causes them to make bad decisions, different decisions than you. They're probably much less thoroughly vetted their ideology, their perceptions, their beliefs than you did. So you underestimate those people. You underestimate their impacts. Another one is called the empathy gap, where what basically we underestimate the impact of emotions on other people and on ourselves. So people who are smart tend to really think of themselves as very rational creatures driven by logic, by reason. When you look at the research, overwhelmingly what drives smart people and not very smart people alike is emotions, is intuitions, is gut reactions. When we feel a certain way, we then do it. We are comfortable with certain information and we trust it. We don't question ourselves. That is fundamentally something we don't do. We don't question ourselves. We feel good about ourselves, about our information. And so we go with our guts. We go with what we feel, we go with what we trust. And we underestimate how this emotional impact of our intuitions and emotions impacts us and impacts other people. So those are some things to watch out for. Mm -hmm. Other folks, other questions? Other questions? Uh, well, if you have other questions, please put them in the chat for Dr. Gleb Sipersky. Um, let's see. At this point, um, unless we have other questions that appear, and please do feel free to, to submit them, uh, we can move into the more social part of the meeting. And uh, I want to take this opportunity to thank Gleb again for uh, sharing his time and expertise with us today. This has been marvelous, really. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Yes. So Eugene Ma asks just briefly, what yeah. types of people tend not to fall for fake news? People who tend to doubt themselves and who change their minds often. So mm -hmm. people who are less confident about themselves. So you'll, those are the kinds of people who tend to fall for fake news less often because they check themselves, they fact check information, and they don't trust their smartness, their intuition, just for that information. Interesting. That is interesting. Wow. Hmm. Cool. 
So people who are skeptics about themselves. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so thank so you very much. If we developed um, more self-confidence, would, uh, would that have an impact on that? Well, people who tend to be more confident are more likely to make bad decisions and fall for fake news. So mm -hmm. when you have, when you are more aware about aware cognitive, about biases, cognitive biases, biases as a problem, as a problem then, then you are you much, are more, much likely more likely to make good, to make decisions, good decisions about the information, about the information because you trust yourself less. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. All right, everyone. Well, this has been lovely. And uh, oh, Angela says, how do you deal with crazy Nadja family members? Uh, it, it really depends on your individual situation. I do have a technique in the book, The Truth Seekers Handbook, on how to talk to people who very clearly believe in falsehoods and how to that undermine their own goals. So in those specific situations, that's something you can go to. So The Truth Seekers Handbook, a science-based guide. It's also going to be in pro-truth, a pragmatic plan to put truth back into politics. But those are on sp certain specific situations. Generally, with people who are crazy nut jobs, you know, family members, I would tend to keep the peace and not really try too hard because, again, they would have to fundamentally change the worldview to not uh, to agree with you, and that's just going to be very hard for you to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. More, more trouble and and pain than it's worth, huh? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right, everyone. All right, everyone. This has been a pleasure, been a pleasure. and you have and a great day. Have... Enjoy the social time. Thank you. Okay, folks, so...